I'm from Total War here, and today we're going to be rating a one bull doom stack covering Torox the Brass Bull, going up against four full stacks of Endgame Crisis Talson forces, which include lots of infantry, lots of single entities, there's dragons, uh, tree men, lords, lots of stuff in here to go up against. And uh, I can already assure you that this has definitely not been trait managed. That's definitely something that we need to check with every single one-man Doomstack submission. And I've also developed a new rating system, which I'll talk about in just a moment. First thing, let's have a look at the equipment that he's got on. got a few banners, but he can only equip one of them. He's got the Banner of Madness, which gives us the Aura of Madness and the Physical Resistance. The Fear and Terror doesn't really matter so much. Um, the Aura of Madness is definitely good, but it only triggers when a unit is lower than 50% of its base leadership. So to find out what its base leadership is, you just check what it is right now. So for example, the War Dancers Azrae Spears, their leadership is 90. So that means I have to get their leadership down to 45 or lower in the battle. Now the thing is, because this is on very hard battle difficulty, it gets added on an additional 8. So it's easier to affect this ability if you're playing on lower battle difficulties than if you're playing on higher battle difficulties. On higher battle difficulties, you nearly have to wipe out a unit before it'll actually get affected by that. Um, we've also got the Sword of Cain dominating. Now, Sword of Cain is a contentious topic because sometimes I, I uh, lower the score of a um, one-man Doomstack for picking it up and sometimes I don't. And it may, may seem arbitrary, but it isn't. It largely comes down to how significant the impact of the Sword of Cain is on that particular faction. Some factions are hurt by it more than others. And that's what I always take into consideration. So I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, we've got the Armor of Destiny, Talisman of Preservation, and Pendant of Slanesh. I don't think the Pendant of Slanesh is particularly useful, but whatever. That's just an enchanted arm. I don't think you can really get anything better. Let's jump in here and see where it goes. So in terms of um, Sword of Cain, it always comes down to how, how badly affected is the faction by the negative effects of the Sword of Cain. And I get that some people don't care about that kind of stuff, but I always take it into consideration because I think campaign um, penalties are bad, basically. So with the Beastmen, there's no downside to picking up the Sword of Cain. So always pick it up. You know, there's just no downsides to it. Because the penalties are minus 40 relations to all faction, which for the Beastmen doesn't matter, they're not a diplomatic faction. The only people they can do diplomacy with is like Skaven, so don't worry about that. Um, minus 8 public order to all provinces, that doesn't matter, they don't have public order, you literally can't, can't have a revolt as the Beastmen, so it doesn't matter whatsoever. And minus, sorry, plus 10% extra um, upkeep cost, which the Beastmen don't pay any upkeep cost for any of their units, unless you get alliance units. So, it just doesn't matter whatsoever. So, it's just, it's just not affected by them, so always pick it up. Now, in terms of like the Dark Elves, however, they're a faction that, if you're playing on legendary difficulty, can be very heavily impacted by the Sword of Cain. And for them specifically, it's about the public order, because the the Dark Elves are a faction that have very bad public order due to their slaves, and they don't have many global bonuses to mitigate that. And they pretty much require getting all of their public order bonus buildings on legendary difficulty in order to maintain public order if you've got high slaves. So when you add on an additional eight public order penalty on top of that, a lot of your recently conquered provinces will take longer to, um, to stabilize because of the Sword of Cain. And so that will mean that your expansion will actually slow down because of the Sword of Cain, therefore hurting your campaign. It's, you know, things along those lines. And if there's a faction that, you know, is particularly weak in terms of their economy, then they shouldn't pick up Sword of Cain because plus 10% extra upkeep costs can really hurt them. But, for example, another faction that it doesn't really matter too much for is like the High Elves, that can infinitely keep increasing their public order through their heroes, and their finances are well under control. So the extra upkeep cost and the, um, the public order penalties are not an issue. However, the relationship with all other factions is an issue for the High Elves because of how much they rely on diplomacy. So they shouldn't pick it up, but they can mitigate some of the penalties. Okay, now, what we're going to do here is charge into melee, which I know, right? That's probably not what you were expecting me to do. Um, but yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge in. All right, so just charge on in. So one thing that I've noticed with the AI in Warhammer 3 
is their willingness to just throw into a blob very early on. Oh, I forgot to take us the ward save. So with this, we got 40% extra damage resistance, but it was that 76 base ward save. We've got 25% physical resistance, so he's always at his maximum physical resistance. And uh, a bit of missile resistance here. Try to get him to focus on the single entities where possible. And of course he's got Gore Feast over here, so he's got natural regeneration, so yeah, he's not gonna be taking damage real quickly. Come on, attack the dragon. The infantry shouldn't be doing much to you. Yeah, this is what I found happens in Warhammer 3, right? If you give an attack order when there is the situation, sometimes they'll derp out a fair bit. Also, it's on large unit scale, which doesn't impact whether or not this one-man doom stack is more or less viable. But I think in terms of entertainment value, I don't accept normal or small unit scale, because it just doesn't look as good in these videos. And usually, usually I get people being like complaining about those, those unit scales. That being said, most people do send it in either large or ultra. But yeah, look how willing the AI is to just get into a blob here. They don't do this in Warhammer 2. You can test it out right now. What they'll do is they'll send in a couple of units, and you definitely can get a blob going in Warhammer 2, right? But not to this extent where the AI is willing to throw in their archers into melee here. I find this weird. So in order to counter cheese in Warhammer 3, they made one-man doomstacks way more viable. So what you want to be doing with Torox is trying to aim for the single entities with his melee attacks because you're just not going to kill that many infantry with each of his melee hits. And uh, just wait for this to recharge to get rid of the uh, infantry. Now I think that um, given a similar equipment set that Morgur might actually be a better one man doomstack than Torox. But I haven't seen one of those yet. Just because of his um, mortis engine effect, and also the fact that he's smaller. Although he wouldn't get as much ward save as Torox. I don't think. Lots more missile resistance. So try to get rid of these um, dragons. You gotta keep giving the order over and over again, because he will forget. They do forget their orders. Alright, speed up a little bit. Because four full stacks, no matter what you're doing, will usually take a little while. Right, I also said about the new rating system. So, the new system, it's not that different from the old system, really. But what we're going to do is compare each of these one man doom stacks to what was the previous record holder for the best one man doom stack. So, in terms of the best one-man doom stack in the game, in terms of just raw combat ability, not necessarily in terms of practicality, because one-man doom stacks are never practical, really, so I should just toss out the practicality side of things, really, um, except for the sort of cane side of things, um, is Mal Starkblade, obviously. He's the king of one-man doom stacks. He's definitely the best one so far. And so what we'll do is we'll rate every one of these doom stacks compared to Mal Starkblade. So on a scale of zero to one, basically. If you get a zero, you are nothing compared to uh, Malice Darkblade. If you get a one, that means you are equal to one uh, to uh, Malice Darkblade. So, for example, if you get a 0 0.5, then that what I'm saying there is that it requires two of those characters to be equal to one Malice Darkblade on the battlefield. <laughs> hope, hope that makes sense. So we'll see how Torox does. So some advantages and disadvantages that he has over Malice is he, he, well, let's start with disadvantages. He can't kill as quickly as Malice because if you go full Zarkan, 
Uh, you've also got access to Soul Stealer, as well as, assuming they've got the same equipment, um, so, as well as the uh, Sword of Cain, you've got Soul Stealer dishing out a lot. In, in fact, I would say that the Soul Stealer would actually end up doing more damage to, than the Sword of Cain because you use it more frequently and it, it will affect more units, including single entities. It'll do more damage to them. Also, Malice Darkblade has, like, by default, if you've got the Sword of Cain, maxed out ward save. Whereas Torx the Brass Bull only has maxed out ward save when you're at the Brass body. The another thing is that uh, Malice Darkblade has two pools of health, which means two pools of health regeneration. And uh, Torox doesn't have that. Right, we still got quite a few units to come in. Not really going to worry too much about getting this stuff down perfectly on time. Uh, okay, so I could use Vile Entropy to drop down the um, the balance of power of the archers by a little bit. But since they're not shooting, it's not really that much of a concern. But here's the thing. Maybe I don't really want to do that. Because I want him to get as many kills as possible. Because <laughs> if I do that, it pulls the army losses a bit earlier. Alright, so... Nothing's doing too much damage to him. If we have a look here, we can see... Yeah, it's doing like a couple of hundred damage. Yeah, 100 damage is nothing. Pop it down directly in the middle and just hope that it actually goes in a decent direction and stays sort of going around. But sometimes this has a habit of just wandering. Yeah, way off course. It happens. It'd be nice if that made them go rampage so they're going to melee with us here. I have no means of getting to them. Cool. Very easy one-man doom stack to use for sure. Very easy. Just throw him into melee and then just wait for the abilities to be used. I really don't need to be doing that. It's a complete waste. It's a waste of a cliff, not that it really matters. Now the Pendant of Slanesh is actually kind of wasted because getting 202 melee attack is... it's just like... it looks like a great number, right? Like, to see high numbers equals good, right? Not really. Um, there's a point to which getting additional melee attack and melee defense becomes completely pointless, right? So if we have a look at the the uh, melee attack and melee defense of the units that we're going up against, they're like in between the 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? And the way it works is that melee attack and melee defense doesn't um, doesn't affect how much damage you do. It affects your hit chance and your um, enemy's miss chance, right? But it caps at 92%. So, if let's just say, if a 100 melee attack was able to guarantee 92% hit chance against every single unit in this army, which it probably is, then getting 150 melee attack will have the exact same result. Same thing with melee defense, right? If your melee defense is like 50 points higher than anything that they've got in their army, then getting any more isn't going to do anything. The weapon strength is always useful, there's no cap on that. Same thing with health, the more health you can get the better. But yeah, I'm just talking in regard to the Pendant of Slanesh in terms of an equipment. Extra 40 melee attack here isn't going to make a bit of difference. The only thing that would be useful is for like charging in at the beginning of the fight, the extra 25% speed is useful. But that's, that's all I can think of. It wouldn't hurt him to get a little bit more armor, although, you know, he's, he's blocking the vast majority of hits, 75% minimum of um, uh, non-armor piercing damage. So far, we have killed off 1,500-ish of them. And also Deadly Onslaught. So the game can be a little bit unclear, like, you think, ooh! 25% extra weapon strength on top of 1,000, that'd be heaps. But what a, a lot of people don't realize, and it's really the game's fault for 
being as clear as mud about this stuff, is that any sort of damage boost that's a percentage is always a percentage based on your base damage. So that's only going to give you like 100 extra damage, regardless of whether you got a sword with cane or not. Which is why when we triggered this, we didn't go up by 25%, we went up by like 100. It wasn't that much. But yeah, Creative Assembly could definitely do a better job of being a bit clearer about how these stats work. Because I think a lot of players will just look at this stuff and just not know how to read it, just because the game doesn't tell you how it works. Yeah. People just say, oh, 162 melee attack, well then 200 would be better, surely. It's exactly the same. Yeah, nothing here has 100 melee defense. Yeah, nothing, so... Irrelevant. And also, like, the bonus versus large. They put it under weapon strength, right? Bonus versus large, 15. Now, I was definitely victim to this information as well. When I first started playing this game, I saw, you know, that. I'd be like, wow, only 15 extra weapon strength um, on, on, like, single entities. That seems like nothing, but what it turns out is that um, it's weapon strength and also melee attack against those particular units. So it would make more sense for the UI to put that bonus versus large icon under both, but it doesn't do that. So the information is not clear. A lot of players don't know this. They look at bonus versus infantry and bonus versus large and not really care about it, but they're very good, because it's an um, extra chance to hit against those particular unit types. Alright, everything's in good here, we're still at full health. That's just slowly pushed us around, but they're just not doing any serious damage. Yeah, I don't need to use that. What for? They're not shooting at us. They're not even trying to shoot at us. They just want to go straight into melee. God, I'm trying to keep killing those guys. But for the most part, just let him do whatever he wants. Because <laughs> he's doing fine. Very easy army to use. Good, two and a half thousand kills already. Now the uh, Wood Elves will have a bit of a stat boost inside of the forest here, but... Torox the Brass Bull actually doesn't, so they're getting extra melee defense here, but even with that extra melee defense, it's still not going to protect them against this, so it literally doesn't matter if they're fighting in the forest or not. Because his melee attack is simply too high. Yeah, get rid of this dude. He's pissing me off. So yeah, it goes up by about one or two hundred with this. Which is not Alright, he's used up all of his regen now. Okay, which means that if we take damage down to about here, it'll slow down the uh, potential early army losses. Because the amount of regen that you've got in reserve doesn't count towards balance of power, but once you've used that up and your health starts going down, our balance of power is actually going to drop, which makes it more difficult to inflict the army losses, although I think I'm really close to it anyway. Pretty sure one more of these and we're there. Like, he's okay there at the moment. Because they don't have much left. They've lost three quarters of their army. If you take out this single entity here, you'll definitely do some more. 
So we can also see here that most of these units are not being affected by the Banner of Madness. It's because their leadership is simply too high. Even if you take this unit here, this one here is being affected by it. Because its leadership is low, so yeah, that one's, that one's getting wrecked. But we take this one over here. Down that much health, it's not being affected by it because their leadership isn't... Um, yeah, see, base value 85. You need to be half of that. And all these other modifiers, including difficulty, will mitigate it. So Banner of Madness is better on lower difficulties. Good, kill that Tree Man Lord. And... Will this cause the army losses? Yep, I thought it would. So, because he took a little bit of damage, I thereby decree that he is a shit one-man doomstack. No, I'm just kidding. He was very good. Especially considering... He's uh, not actually ma maxed out. So we'll go when we go into the campaign map. I'll show a bunch of things that this guy didn't do that he could have done to make it better, and we would have been at full strength at the end of this battle if he had done that. But it's fine. You get the gist of it. You get the gist of it. The stuff that he didn't do was mainly hit point related, which you know, wasn't worth rejecting the uh, the doomstack on that basis. And we can sort of predict how much better he would be. Um, if he did have it. But yeah, one thing that we always need to do now whenever we um, rate these one-man doom stacks is check to make sure they've not been trait managed. I mean, it's, it's impossible to 100% guarantee that it hasn't been, but, you know, if you see, like, 20 traits all in a row, then you can pretty safely assume that it's been trait managed. Whereas if you see... Like, defeat trait, then racial, like, killed a bunch of uh, enemies of that particular race, which they all, that um, trait always sucks. Because a lot of people, what they do with the trait managers is take the, that one out. If you see, like, mixed in amongst all the good traits, a whole bunch of bad traits, that's usually an indication that they didn't use it, because that looks more natural as to, as to the gameplay. <laughs> All right, let's have a look at this. So, looking at the traits, you know, he's got a whole bunch of crappy traits in here. So, Lost Your Dire Fin, Shadows Fall, these are ones that you just don't need to get. Chaos Breaker, Achieve Victory Over Warriors of Chaos, loads of times. Uh, he's got Pride Assassin, that's a definitely good one. But he's he would have already been at the Physical Resistance cap even without this. So, he didn't need to go hunting down the physical resistance traits, but if we have a look here. Just looking for it. Yeah, there it is. He's got the brazen one. So, this is a trait unique to um, Torox the Brass Ball. Uh, especially useful if you're a one-man doomstack, because you essentially just need to win five battles with him and you get that extra 10% ward save, which is really good. Um, yeah, defeat Carl friends. you just don't need to be doing that. So the main trait here that I wanted to see, that I'm not seeing, is Throt's Defeat trait. 10% extra health. The other one I'm not seeing here is uh, Drenched in Gore. So that would have given him 20% extra health. So we have a look at his stats. He could have gotten, whatever his base health was, which I, I can't remember exactly on large unit scale, he could have gotten 30% extra health on top of this. So that probably would have meant, I don't know, about... 1,500 to 2,000 extra health, which would have meant 1,500 extra health regen, which would have meant that he would have ended the battle at full strength. So he's not actually at full power. In terms of extra melee attack and melee defense, this is fine. Um, getting above 100 melee defense would be preferable. So hunting down Krokgar and uh, Nakai would be useful for that. Some bonus versus infantry and large also 
useful but not essential because his melee attack is just so high. Um, in terms of resistances, the only thing that you would really want to do here is get more ward save to be blocking magical attacks. Physical resistance isn't needed, so you do not, do not need to go and hunt down um, Wurzag and Archeon's defeat trait. You just don't need to do that. And I think that he's absolutely capped out the ward save here for this character. So if we have a look and add it all up, we should be able to see 76%. So we've got 10% from here. You've got 30% from the Sword of Cain, so that's 40%. You've got 10% from here, that's 50%. Then you've got 66% here. And then with this one here, you've got it at 71%. And then you've got, there it is, 76% through bullish metal there. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. In terms of having uh, how we let it level them up, I think that was the correct call. Apocalyptic vision would have been nice, but not essential. Like I said, his melee attack was was fine. Some more missile resistance could have been useful, just in case you go up against magic missiles. But they barely shot at us, so I guess you really didn't need to anyway. Um... Because, yeah, I don't see why you needed to get down the blue line here if you're making a one-man doomstack, but that doesn't really matter. Okay, so in terms of rating this, so this current one-man doomstack here, I'd say is a 0 0.7 uh, on a on a Malice Dark Blade. So you'd need 1 and 30% of another one, I guess, in order to be worth Malice Dark Blade. Now, the thing is, if you had maxed this out, just with the hit point trait, so that's um, Drenched in Gore and um, Defeated Throts trait, I'd say that um, Torx the Brass Ball would probably then have been worth 0.75 Malice Dark Blade. So, maybe even 0.8. So, there's a bit of room to improve there, but I'd say that no matter what you do, you are never going to be able to have um, Torx the Brass Ball be as good of a one-man Doomstack as Malice Darkblade. Not by not by a terrible degree. Like 0.8 Malice Darkblade is still really good, right? Because you gotta consider this. Malice Darkblade has a ridiculous amount of health because of um, two regen pools and two health pools. He's got some really good abilities. He can go on foot, so that can make him really useful for dealing with infantry and missile units. And he can go on spite if he wants to be like a duelist going up against lots of single entities. That would be all right for him. So he's got speed on his side for there. Um, but if you go full Tsarkan, so, okay, Malice Dark Blade has maximum ward save by default. So he's taking less damage than, than Torox the Brass Ball. Uh, no, sorry, he's got maximum ward save assuming he's got all the equipment, including the Sword of Cain. Um, and then of course, when you're Tsarkan, you've got the Soul Stealer ability, which is, that is such a good ability to have as something that doesn't require winds of magic because that regenerates your health and it one of the most important things that that does is it really severely hurts single entities which most spells in the game doesn't really do much so that's really where malice dark blade has a big edge over um over torox of brass ball even though torox of brass ball might hit harder with each individual hit of um, his melee, Malice Darkblade has just got other abilities to compensate him for that, including debuffs to like lower him, whereas he doesn't have that. So anyway, that's the end of this one here, guys. Let me know in the comments below what you think of Torx the Brass Bull as a one-man Doomstack. Um, I would be really keen to try out a Morgor one-man Doomstack. I think that's something that could be better than this, especially against very like large numbers of, of uh, infantry, but uh, we'll see how we go. Um, just to give you guys a bit of an update, we are 250 subs away from hitting 455,000 subscribers. So, since we've got about a week left until the live stream, and we're roughly getting about 50 subscribers a day, roughly, um, it seems as though we're going to make it about two days before the, uh, the end of year live stream. So, it's, it seems like we're on track to get it. That being said, if you guys hit that subscribe button now, you can get us over the line today. That's entirely up to you. Um, we don't need to. Anyway, that's in this one. I just wanted to let you guys know, because you guys can't see the exact number of subscribers that I've got, but I can. Uh, I'm at like 454,750 subscribers, so we're, we're very close. Anyway, that's in this one. Appreciate you guys, and we'll see you next time. Later, guys. Bye.